The loop of Hanai here, right down the bottom, is something you'll hear about quite frequently in pharmacology, because pharmacology, you give loop diuretics, right? Which actually either increases, it increases the output of urine. So people who are, who have, um, who are retaining fluids, who have congestive heart failure, that type of thing, you may be giving them a loop diuretics. So you will see that again in pharmacology. Uh, what else? The Bowman's capsule, we're going to talk about all this, all the PowerPoints that follow are all about these things. Bowman's capsule is shown here, and it's just around the glomerulus. And the glomerulus is the major part of the nephron that is filtering. It's right in the middle here. Like you can see the capsule around it, which is oh, Bowman's capsule, and then right in here inside is the glomerulus. So those probably are the most important parts of that picture. And we'll carry on. Okay. So what are the components of the urinary system and functions? The baby. Uh oh, I did it again. There we go. That just has another, I just have another uh, PowerPoint that just shows you a general anatomy as well. So the, kidney, the kidneys produce the urine, the ureter transports it. Don't get the ureter and the urethra mixed up when you're writing exams because they sound very similar, but make sure you differentiate the two. The ureter is from the kidney down to the bladder, the urethra is from the bladder to the exterior. Okay, <laughs> good. Okay, three functions of the urinary system excretion, filtration. So it's removal of your waste products in the blood system and all the other cells about, but they do arrive by the blood to be cleaned out. Elimination is getting rid of these waste products. When they say into the environment here, they mean getting rid of the waste products in the urine. I don't know why, I don't know why I put that. Anyway, <laughs> why did they do that? After so when I go back and read my PowerPoints, I go, well, what did I say that for? Anyway, so homeostatic regulation. The, the kidneys are the most important part of the body for homeostasis, right? They're balancing all of the blood volume and the um, concentration of the blood system. So they are the most important part. Kidneys, of course, excrete urine. And urine contains water, ions, small soluble compounds, minerals, and waste products. So these are all from metabolism, right? All your waste products of metabolism from digesting your foods, any waste products coming from that, any cellular metabolites as well that are put into the circulatory system. Urinary tract, everything below the kidneys. That's quite simple. Again, I highlighted the urethra because don't be all the time talking about that. <laughs> okay. Um, micturition, now you rarely will hear that word. It's the medical term for urination. You're going to hear urinary all the time or urination. You're not going to hear micturition, but it's just there. In case you, in case you um, come across it one day and wonder what the heck they're talking about. <laughs> okay. So your bladder is actually just a storage container for the urine. And it um, what they call decompresses. When you go to the washroom and you sit down, you actually, can, it, the bladder decompresses when you go to the bathroom. Homeostatic functions, which I said were the most important part of the kidneys, to regulate blood volume and blood pressure. When we're talking about, um, yeah, it was neural. We talked about barrel receptors and those type of things, and so that type of thing we're talking about here. So adjusting the volume of the water lost in urine and releasing erythropoietin and renin.
And those are the control mechanisms. You okay? Yeah. Regulates uh, plasma ion concentrations, and those are all the um, sodium potassium chloride. And you've seen this before, calcitrol, right? When we talked about bone. And also it's in your um, endocrine as well. Helps stabilize the pH of the blood, the acid base of the blood. Now, normal blood pH runs from 7.35 to 7.45. So it's slightly basic alkaline. Neutral pH is 7. So when they're concerned about the pHs of the blood, or sorry, the urine. Um, people who have a low pH, which is below the seven, oftenly, oftentimes will have, be more um, prone to infections because the acidity of the urine helps get rid of the infection. The acidity of urine also helps um, dissolve calculi. So if you have any little stones in the bladder, it would help dissolve those as well. So that's one of the important reasons that the urine should be a bit, little bit more acidic. The kidneys also hold back your glucose and sodium and amino acids. So you, it prevents amino acids, so your proteins, you don't spill proteins out of your body. Um, and glucose, of course, for uh, anybody who is a diabetic, they will often spill glucose because as soon as the blood concentration of glucose is high, it pushes the kidneys over the what they call the renal threshold and the kidney starts spilling glucose into the urine. Um, you can detect that when you do your dipsticks, right? You see your, you can see glucose there, and you can also see ketones as well. They're helping the liver as well to detoxify poisons, which means a lot of, not a lot, but a, a the majority of your medications are detoxified by the liver, but there are medications that are detoxified or um, excreted in the kidney. So it kind of assists the liver to help with medications and metabolize the drugs. There are lots of drugs that can be nephrotoxic, meaning that they can damage the nephron. Uh, some of your Chemo drugs for sure can do that. And I'm trying to think of any other ones that would do that. They're talking, oh, they're talking in high doses. Um, there's some antibiotics that will do that as well, do some damage to the kidney. So when doctors are prescribing medications, that's why they have to be very aware of whether the person's kidney functions are good. And we'll talk a little bit about that too, um, or kidney functions later on. Position of the kidneys, that's quite easy. It is, they are up, you know, either side of your spine, but up under, just underneath your rib cage in the back. They have a protective layer of fat, so they're not as easily damaged. They also are behind the muscle layer in the fat to protect them as well. The rib cage does help to give some bony protection for any trauma that can, trauma that can happen to them and they are capped by the adrenal gland on the top there. The right kidney sits a little bit lower than the left, and that's due to the liver. The liver's kind of taking up some space there. Okay. An adult kidney, you don't have to know this, but this is just an interest thing, um, can be 10 centimeters long, 5.5 wide and 3 centimeters thick. Now, I don't think this is very thick. You know, I thought, well, it's not that thick. <laughs> you know? so, and 
Yeah. Yeah, your kidneys, yeah. Yeah. So they're not very big. When you think of the amount of work they have to do and yeah. the responsibility they have, they should be bigger. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So we just have a diagram here, and again, it just covers the gross anatomy of really here, all you have to worry about is and the hilum just gives you whereabouts they're located. There's really not much there that we are going to use. The hilum is a prominent medial indentation. And we'll go back, I'll just go back to the other room. So this is what they're talking about. Like they're shaped like little kidney beans. And the hilum is this area in here, the indentation in there. So that's the hilum. And the significance of the hilum is in the entry point of the renal artery and the renal nerves. So that's where they all come in. The exit point, the renal vein, and the ureters. And you can read that. Um, all blood goes through the kidneys, and it has to go through the filtration system. It's not really filtrated anywhere else other than the liver, but they all end up going through the kidneys. The structure of the kidney, we saw, I have handed out the students that are here. And I have a bigger picture, hang on. Let's see this one here. And we did look at that earlier, so it is probably in your textbook, but it's this one right here, da, 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 which shows you the cortex and the medulla, the pyramids of those triangular shapes, and the capsule of the outer membrane. Are you good with that? Or? Okay. <laughs> so the papilla, which is this little narrow base of, it's a little triangle. And it's this area right here that the base of the triangle coming down here. Should use a pen. Yes, I've lost my pen. Go right in here, this area right here at the base of, the tr of these little triangles. The columns are bands of tissue between the pyramids and they're for support, of course. That makes sense. And the lobe is just a term to describe one of the pyramids and the adjacent structures. Oh, more pictures, eh? <laughs> so you can see here, it's a bit easier on this one for sure, to see the cortex, the medulla, the renal pyramid. Uh, where's our calyces in here? Sometimes you'll get, um, of calcification, which are stones that are actually shaped right like these calluses. They fill them right up and they call them staghorn because they look like a staghorn when they take them out. Yeah. But this whole thing is full of, of uh, calcification. So that's a pretty major stone. And the problem is with any stone that's going to build up in there like that, it's going to damage the drainage system. So it will damage the kidney. Yeah, so you can get little teeny ones, which most people have small ones. The staghorn ones are very large, and they are very rare, too. Yeah, they would be. <laughs> and the kidney's non-functional at that time, so that's it's really bad. Okay, urine drainage is produced 
in the renal lobes, and we've already discussed what a renal lobe includes. And the calluses, these are the ones I was talking to, that's the drainage system where they, a pelvis or kidney pelvis, and that's where every, all the urine drains into before it heads off down the ureter. Nephron. Now, there's a basic functional unit of the kidney, so please remember that because you're going to see that again, where the urine is production begins. They are, I have a picture of it here. Where's it? <clears throat> okay. Yeah. And we did just look at them earlier. But that is your nephron. So you can see here the Bowman's capsule here, the glomeruli in here, all of the vessels that are supporting um, the circulatory system. You can see these are convoluted. You can see the, the, the uh, twists in those, like they're just kind of bends. The loop of henni, which we talked about as well. Where am I here? Okay. Then out and then down the ureter to be, to be sent down to the bladder. Okay. So, renal two, renal close. I think we did that. <laughs> They're sympathetically innervated. They adjust the rate of urine formation by changing the blood flow and blood pressure. Now that's important because if someone has high blood pressure, it actually can damage these nephrons. So that's another reason why people should be monitored for their blood pressure um, because they can do kidney damage with having constant high blood pressure. Kidneys are extremely sensitive little organs and they really don't like Changes in the blood pressure. <clears throat> so the sympathetic innervation stimulates the release of renin, which restricts the loss of water and salt. So it holds it back by stimulating the nephron to hold the water back to pull it back. The renal corpuscle contains the glomeruli, and we talked about the Bowman's capsule already, and we saw it in the picture. So the blood enters the glomeruli via the afferent arterioles. Here we go with the afferent and the efferent again. So afferent is going in and exits by the efferent. <clears throat> The filtered substances enter the capsule space in the Bowman's capsule. So the glomerulus is sitting in the middle, and then you've got this little balloon shape around it, which is the Bowman's capsule, and the fluid in there is, it sits in that capsule for filtration. We're going to be going back to some of these um, ideas again when we do the electrolytes at the end, fluids and electrolytes at the end of the, of the course, which I'm not looking forward to. <laughs> They're hard to explain. It's just like, oh. anyway, I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. So just here you can see a glomeruli in this picture. And you can see the afferent coming in having all the blood circulation through here with all these teeny little vessels and then coming out the efferent. So this space in here, the capsular space, is where a lot of your um, filtration is happening. And you can see once the filtration is done, then it heads off out the proximal convoluted tubule. And that convoluted tubule I showed you earlier um, going downwards from here. Doo -doo. 
where is it? Just coming out and down is the convoluted tubule. So I'll just read what it says to you because I think it's a little bit hard to see. It blood enters the kidney via the renal artery and reaches each nephron via the afferent arterial. The bulk of filtration occurs within this capsule. And what is removed from the blood enters the tubules and is processed again. Like it, it, whatever is entered here is pushed down these tubules. Whoops, oh dear, sorry. <laughs> That really jumped a lot. Okay. Ah, here we go. <clears throat> yeah, that's right, it does. It wants to go home. I don't know what's <laughs> anyway. Mm -hmm. So again, we're just repeating what we have said before the Bowman's capsule is the main filter filtration location. The blood leaving the capsule via the efferent arterial enters the vast capillary beds within the kidney. Within the capillary beds, the blood is available for secondary filtration and reabsorption in the tubular portion. So once it goes through um, the glomeruli, then it goes down the tubes, and there's more filtration that happens as it goes down the small tubes. So this is important because without this um, involvement with the absorption of water and, and distribution of water, the, the kidneys actually put out a tremendous amount of water, but it's held back. Otherwise, it would revolve, result in fatal dehydration. <clears throat> so just another example here is the filtration out of metabolic, metabolic waste, excess ions, necessary compounds are also filtered out. Glucose is, is kept back. Your fatty acids and your amino acids, which are your proteins, are kept back, and your vitamins are held in and not released into the urine. Otherwise, you would be you know, short of glucose, and you would be suffering from malnutrition. So these, these um, components are recaptured in the proximal convol convoluted tubule. I know this is a little complicated, but like I say, later on when we talk about um, electrolytes, then it'll make more sense. Okay, I'll just let you read through that because we've kind of talked about these already. Okay. The renal tubule, part of the nephron to which the glomerule filtrate passes after entering the capsular space. And the first part of the renal tubule is called the proximal convoluted tubule. And you've already had that. <laughs> okay, oops, I'm sorry. I went too far. Okay, back. So the reason I put this in in color is the loop of hand uh, you will see again. So just to make note of that, so we've chatted already about that as well. Go ahead, Bennett, if you want to write it down. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Good. <clears throat> So the convoluted tubules absorb water, and that's what I mean. They prevent us from being dehydrated. So that's their job. So the peritubular space is obviously outside of the tubes. So that's they're talking here with the peritubular. And so any of these filtrations, like the water and organics, is picked up by the capillaries and put back into the circulatory system to be reused again. The loop of hands, responsible for the bulk of urine concentration. And I think the handout that I gave the class here is about medications. Right? It tells you about medications. 
as well when they're involved. I, hopefully I can scan it and send it out. The printing's not very good because I took it out of a textbook and it's missing part of the side of it. <clears throat> so the remaining fluid enters the descending limb, enters, re, sorry, enters the renal medulla. Each limb is thick and thin portions and allowing transfer of molecules. And the water is absorbed into the capillaries of the medulla. And we just have a picture again of the loop of hen, but we've seen that lots. <laughs> so it is responsible for sodium, potassium, and other ions, which is very important. When you start giving medication, which affects the loop of hen, it affects the loss of potassium. So you have to have potassium-sparing di diuretics. And if you don't have those, then you have to make sure you supplement the patient's diet or give them supplemental potassium tablets. <clears throat> the distal convoluted tubule, active secretion of ions and drug toxins from the capillaries that were not captured in the glomerulus, so they will be captured later on as they go down. Now they're to be carried away in the tubular fluid and excreted from the body. There is selective reabsorption at this point in the distal tubule of sodium and calcium. So you don't lose your calcium from your body. It also reabsorbs water to prevent dehydration and to keep homeostasis. Bless you. <laughs> Are you good? Okay. Oh, more pictures. More pictures. Okay. We've actually seen we've seen all these pictures before. Um, it just it's just start gives you more of the collecting system down here, the papillary duct into the calyxes down here. Now this is just one nephron. There's millions and millions of nephron that make up those little pyramids. You don't just have one. You have gazillion of these guys. Okay. <laughs> Conducting duct. The distal convoluted tubules converge to a single collecting duct. Many collecting ducts join together to pour several hundred papillary ducts. Thing of ducks, not ducks, not ducks. <laughs> There's a lady in Penticton, I drive by her place when I go work at, at Slot Shop, and she feeds the ducks, the local ducks, and seriously, her lawn is nothing but ducks everywhere. <laughs> Thousands of ducks. So we can kind of think of her lawn when we're thinking of this. It has many papillary ducks. <laughs> anyway, each, each renal papilla, uh, Contents of the ducts drain into the minor calces and then into the major calyx. And finally into the renal pelvis and then into the ureter. So you have just how it drains there. <clears throat> I'll let you write that down. You might be needing it. Yes, I've been looking a lot at the exam. <laughs> it's actually not a truly. I don't. I don't believe that it's as hard as the midterm. Yeah, and and it is. It's more. It's much more um, even. There's seven. I think there's seven questions per subject. So it's not as. It's seriously not as hard. <laughs> I don't think so anyway. Are there going to be any open-ended questions? Pardon? Is there going to be any open-ended questions? They're all, th no, they're all the um, multiple choice. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's there's what no, I there's, Yeah, they're just all multiple choice. The whole exam is multiple choice. <clears throat> oh, that's okay. Go ahead.
I think there's a couple there's a couple true and false, but still that's still in the multiple choice category, I think it is. Because it's just either true or false. Okay. Oh goodness, more pictures. <laughs> okay. I didn't realize it put so many pictures in here. Okay. So the summary of the four steps: the filtration occurs across the filtration membrane. Water and solute reabsorption occurs mainly in the proximal convoluted tubules, but also in the distal and tubule and calyces. So that kind of summarizes it nicely. Okay, good. Secretion in the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. You get that? Oh. This is kind of repeated, it is for this, because this is just summarizing it. Concentration is the loop of Hannah and the collecting system. Okay. <clears throat> Glomerular filtration rate. Um, it's the amount of filtration the kidneys produce each minute is 125 mils per minute. And because that is in a funny color, you should pay attention to that. <laughs> Probably one of the few numbers you're going to see, but you will see it. Okay. So about 10% of the fluid delivered to the kidneys leaves the bloodstream and enters the capsular spaces. <clears throat> There's more to this. <laughs> Okay. So the levels of control for glomerular, that's a hard word, glomerular filtration rate. <laughs> no, it's, I got to wrap my tongue around that one too. Autoregulation changes the arterial diameter in response to blood pressure changes. Remember I was saying the kidneys are extremely sensitive to blood pressure? Yes. So they actually can affect the amount of filtration that happens and can do some damage if the blood pressure is too high. A lot of your diabetics are on um, statins they, to lower their blood pressure, not necessarily because they have high blood pressure, it's because they're protecting the kidneys. <clears throat> so hormonal regulation by ANP, BNP, Renan angiotensin is initiated by the kidney. Autonomic regulation by the sympathetic division of the autonomic nerve nervous system decreases the glomerular filtration rate for your fight and flight. Now, when they do your blood tests every three months, usually if there's any problems with diabetics, I mean, they will do the glomerular filtration rate, and it will indicate to them the function of the kidneys, how well they are functioning. I won't tell you what mine is. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> anyway, okay. <clears throat> you good, Brenda? Oh, okay. Increased blood volume, it automatically increases the glomerular filtration rate and promotes fluid loss. Hormonal factors further increase the rate. ADH accelerates fluid loss in urine. ADH you might see again, I think I saw it somewhere, but um, I have to think about it. <laughs> I know it was there somewhere. <clears throat> Could be. I think it's involved with something else. 
probably an electrolyte. Loss. Oh, it's a little loss, the cross. A little loss in here. I'm getting tired probably of writing. Your fingers are getting tired. Okay. <clears throat> the organic waste products that are produced from urine filtration are urea. So you can see these when you do um, kidney function tests on your lab results you'll see these things, like you'll see urea, you'll see creatinine, and uric acid, uric acid you'll see in people with gout. They have a high uric acid level, that means those crystals usually get into the joints and cause a lot of pain and discomfort. The creatinine, you often test people for creatinine levels who are going in for CT scans. If they have kidney function, problems already, you have to know the creatinine level before they get their CT scan because the medication that they use during the CT scan, um, which is an IV medication, sometimes can damage the kidneys if they're not functioning properly. So we have to know what the kidney function is first before they get those scans done. Or waste products are dissolved in the bloodstream so they can be eliminated. And the removal is accompanied by water loss. Of course, when you uh, urinate, you lose water. But this is another thing. The organic waste, if the kidneys are not functioning properly, sometimes they will, the organic waste will be taken via the bloodstream to the surface of the skin and they will get what they call a uremic frost, which is little kind of crystals on the skin, which are extremely itchy and very uncomfortable. So if you have patients who are on in kidney failure or having very compromised kidneys, you may get very itchy skin, so bathing them and keeping them comfortable is important. The filtration occurs across the capillary walls. And that's the same kind of thing that you get happening with capillary walls with oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. They're also um, um, what are they? Met metabolic substances are exchanged as well. Okay. <clears throat> The renal threshold is something we talked about a little earlier with glucose, right? If you have a lot of glucose in your bloodstream, the kidneys can only cope with so much, and then they push it above the renal threshold, and you start getting your glucose in your urine. So that's what the renal threshold is. Well, we just talked about that. <laughs> you don't have to talk about that. <laughs> so, so the appearance, appearance of amino acids in the urine can happen after a protein-rich meal, but you really should, should not have um, any protein in your urine. That usually indicates, especially with diabetes, um, that there is some kidney damage. So if you're spilling proteins in your urine, you could easily have some kidney damage. Maturitic peptides, A, N, P, and B, N, P. We saw those earlier. They're released by the heart. I think that's kind of cool. What's the heart got to do with it all? <laughs> anyway, do the increase of blood volume or blood pressure. So it elevates the glomerular pressure, increases the glomerular filtration rate, and increases urine production. Therefore, you're decreasing the volume, so you're decreasing the hard work that the heart is doing, having a high volume. So you would be removing 
And that's where if you have problems with congestive heart failure, like I said, too much volume um, in your blood, then if you take some of the fluid out with your diuretic, then you're helping the filtration rate. You're lowering the filtration rate. Reabsorption and secretion occur in every segment of the nephron, except the renal corpuscle. <laughs> okay, that's the only except. Yeah. And it's in green. Such a nice color. Better than red. Yeah, you can read it. Like the students that are online can read it. <laughs> the red wasn't working at all. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> you probably could make up a little scenario to remind you of all these things. Aldosterone, hormone produced by the adrenal cortex, and we know the adrenal cortex is sitting on top of the kidney, controls the ion pump and channels along the distal collection tubules. Now, when we talk about ion pump and uh, sodium potassium loss and all that stuff, that's going to come up again when we do electrolytes. So it's nice to have this information because you know the basis of it. Yes. So hopefully you can write that down because we're going to be seeing this later. On our last class is electrolytes. The horrible last class. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah, me too, actually. I'm used to the drive. That wasn't a good drive today, I'll tell you. It's, oh boy, it's not nice up there. The connector is bad today. It's just solid ice. It's just, I, and you know, Stephen, my son, right, was here for a while, and he went outside and he says, Mom, he says, you really have terrible tires. So he talked me into getting new tires, and he talked me into getting them studded as well. Thank heavens for that, because truly, I would have never made it across today without those tires. Yeah. 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 And I've, you know, I've driven a lot. I've driven the connector for years and always had studded tires. It was the first year I hadn't had them. Yeah, it wasn't great when we went back last time. So I'm happy to have them on now. But all those people that live in Vancouver don't have to worry about studded tires. Oh. So parathyroid hormones and calcitrol, you've heard that before, regulates reabsorption of calcium and phosphate from the GI tract. Now, when you see this on your exams, anytime I've noticed when I've been reading the exams, if calcium is mentioned, calcitrol is mentioned somewhere in the answer, you know, <laughs> it's already giving you a hint. <laughs> If you can be calm during an exam, it actually, you can pick out a lot of hints. But if you're scared and nervous, you're not thinking clearly, you've missed all those little subtle hints. Again, we're gonna do electrolytes. So this is gonna come up again. So hydrogen ion secretion acidifies tubular fluid, elevates the pH of the blood, And also we'll talk about lactic acidosis and ketosis. Um, lactic acidosis, of course, is lactic acid is produces when, when you have a lot of exercise. And it ends up being, you know, cramps in your muscles and pains in your, usually in your calves. Ketoacidosis is because, because the diabe the, a diabetic person doesn't have the insulin to break down your proteins and your fats, and it can't get the glucose into the cells, it actually puts a, a, patient, a person into starvation mode because the cells can't get their, pro, their glucose, it starts breaking down muscles and it starts breaking down protein. So muscle tissue and, <laughs> and fat tissue, ending up with keto, ketone bodies being produced. And that's how you get ketoacidosis. But I said again that we will be going over this again when we get to um, electrolytes. Control the blood pH 
by hydrogen ion removal and bicarbonate production in the kidneys. Of course, keeping that pH balance is an important part of homeostasis. So alkalosis to control abnormally high blood pH, so acidic blood, right? You want to make it alkaline. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time doing the electrolytes because I really, when I was in training, I had a hard time understanding them. And I, truly, I don't really have my head wrapped around electrolytes. <laughs> Just like, I know that they're important and that I to teach it, it's going to be interesting. I'm going to have to relearn it, the truth. So a healthy adult produces 1,200 mils of urine per day. And because it's in green, guys, <laughs> okay, it's important. Urination is just micturition or, you know, going pee. <laughs> and so many, I've noticed there's a lot of schools that teach their students that they must use correct medical terminology when they're talking to their patients. Uh, you know what? You say this to an elder person, have you urinated today? They'll look at you like, what? Yeah, <laughs> have you gone pee? Oh, yeah, I have yeah, I've done yeah. that. Yeah, that's cool. But oftentimes using medical terms with lay people and people that you're working with uh, as patients, it doesn't work well. Yeah, exactly. And then your instructor gives you heck for using. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I get you guys, I won't give you. I won't give you heck for using those terms. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Diuresis. Elimination of urine typically indicates production of large amounts of urine. So more than there should be. If you've been drinking a lot of fluids and you're producing a lot of urine, then you, you have diuresis. Right? When you want to eliminate fluids from the body, you've given the patient some... Uh, I'm trying to think... Uh, which is our favorite diuretic. <laughs> I'm drawing a blank on it. Ferosamide, sorry. Yeah, ferosamide. We give for IV ferosamide to people who are in congestive heart failure to make sure that they diurese and get rid of that fluid. They get rid of extra amounts of fluid. And diuretics, again, they're to promote water loss. The diuretics work in by reducing the blood volume, the blood pressure, and the extracellular fluid volume. This is just a PowerPoint of the pH, the specific gravity. When you do the dipsticks on urine, on the side of the bottle, you have all this information, right? It tells you what the averages are, what the normals are, so you know what the variance is. You don't have to memorize all that stuff because it's written right on side the bottle. Urine specific gravity just measures the amount, the concentration of particles. So how many particles are in the urine? A dilute urine, urine someone who's been drinking lots of fluid will have a low specific gravity. And somebody who has dehydrated and possibly an elder person who hasn't been drinking anything during the day will have a very high concentration, a high gra specific gravity. And that's how we use it in our nursing is to tell whether people are dehydrated or not. So down here again, specific gravity 1.004 is your average. And it's in green. Yay! <laughs> your analysis. Well, that's your dipsticks, right? Or if you are sending a urine sample off to the lab for um, bacteria. So on your urinalysis, oftentimes in the dipstick, you'll see leukocytes. And you know what leukocytes are for. 
right? They're white cells, so therefore it indicates they've got an infection. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right, yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah, if she has no ketones, then that's a good thing. You can, yeah, you can actually. <clears throat> so this is an intravenous pilogram, or an IVP is what they're called. And it just is a injecting a radiopaque substance into the bloodstream that it outlines the kidney calluses. You can see here the little tree-like things, the ureters and the bladder. So that's what you'd see. If you had an IVP ordered, that's what you're ordering. Uh, visualization of the, ur the urinary tract. Oops, oh, I did it again. Okay. Oh, boy, I went ahead, way ahead. Okay. <laughs> Back we go. I know. Don't press it so hard. That's what my problem is. There we go. Urine transport and storage. Um, it's quite easy, right? Your ureters come down from your kidneys. The urinary bladder is your big storage balloon. And your urethra is the exit to the outside. Yes, you did this already. <laughs> it's okay, though. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. So here you can see the ureter. The ureter is coming down here. Come to the top of the bladder, they're around kind of the back, come around the back, and they're part way down actually in the bladder. Around here, you can see around your urethra in a male is the prostate gland, right, where your um, male sex hormones are produced, part of them. Uh, they are, work in conjunction with the testes, so they, they are the but in males, you have this around there. And this is what causes a lot of problems in the elderly. The prostate gland is like a donut, and the urethra runs right down the middle. And so as it swells with age and, you know, prostate cancers or prostate hypertrophy happens with aging, it's, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it starts to close off, close off the urethra. Yes, I am. I don't want to cough into the mic. <coughs> Sorry. That's just too much. Yeah, that's right. That's just too much talking. <coughs> there. I think it's over. I think it's over now. No more coughing. Um, so when you put a urinary catheter in to help drain the bladder, because what happens, this is closed off, and then they can't um, urinate. Yeah. So the bladder gets backed up and filled with urine. It's very hard sometimes to get the catheter through this um, prostate. Run. It's a challenge. Pardon me? So what happens... The catheter in a female goes in once you find the urethra, which yeah. is the challenge. Once you find the urethra in a female, because it's very short, it's only like two inches long, not very long. That's why women get more infections than men. Um, it's easy to get in. It just slides in. But with a male, if they have an enlarged prostate, yes, you do hit something that's quite hard. It's not hard, but it's just restrictive, right? Yeah. It's sliding in quite easily, then suddenly you'll come to a stop. It's quite painful for the patient. I try to use an awful lot of, um, we have xylocaine gel, and if you put that on the, on the catheter, and you also put it down the penis as well, it freezes it, and it's really much less painful. I use it on women too, because it's just, why make people suffer <laughs> unnecessarily, right? You have to ask them if they're allergic though first, because some people are allergic to xylocaine. So always remember allergies whenever you do stuff. So ureters are a muscular pair of tubes <clears throat> from the kidney to the urinary bladder. 
They begin at the renal pelvis and they're attached to the posterior wall. And I showed you that in the picture, how they go down behind the bladder and they're attached lower down into the bladder. I don't know why that's an advantage. <laughs> I always wonder why these things are built this way. Like, yeah. why is it an advantage to have them in the back instead of in the top? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> so the foot-like shape of the blad of the ureters when they come into the bladder is just to stop the backflow of urine, so it doesn't creep up into the kidneys and start backing up. Okay. So there are peristaltic contractions, just like we talked about with peristalsis. It's just that um, tightening and relaxing of the muscle as it moves things downwards, just like your esophagus to your tummy. Um, so it begins with the re renal pelvis and it goes down the ureter, or the urine down into the bladder. And it happens every 30 seconds. That's going to say, I was going to say that. Sometimes I think it happens a lot more frequently. <laughs> so especially when I'm driving across the connector and I'm like, I really need to stop. <laughs> okay. So the urinary bladder is just a hollow balloon and it's a temporary reservoir and it will hold about a liter of urine, but that's kind of quite a lot actually. Most people avoid around Three to four hundred, you know that that area. That's that's a lot. It'll hold that much, but it shouldn't probably hold that much. <clears throat> There's retention. Yeah, you should be able to empty your bladder completely, but not very many people can. There's always about thirty cc's retained. Okay, so the lining has folds, blue guy, kind of like your stomach, right? It has those folds, so. The bladder is um, like a balloon, it's deflated and then it fills up and the rugae just disappear and stretch out. <clears throat> so it acts like a funnel and it just drains down into the urethra. I remember it talks about the stimulation to uh, avoid. So once you reach a certain amount of fluid in your bladder, there's a stimulation to void, and it's usually because a teeny little drop of urine goes down and stimulates the, the to say, oops, I have to go to the bathroom. It gives you a warning. So the region surrounding the urethra opening is called the neck of the bladder, and it's smooth muscle with an internal urethral sphincter that provides involuntary con control, I should say voluntary control, involuntary or voluntary both, control of urine. That really should say voluntary control, because really, if you've decided to go to the washroom, yeah, it's voluntary control. I don't know why the in got in there. Maybe it was prevents involuntary. That could have been it. That's a mistake. I have to read. I have to redo that one. <laughs> Good. Good. Because <laughs> when you choose to go to the bathroom, that's yeah. voluntary. Right, so it's voluntary control. The male urethra, it's quite a bit longer, 18 to 20 centimeters, and the female is only three to five centimeters. We kind of have to know these. The reason why we have to know them is for catheterizations, right? When you're catheterizing a male, you put most of the catheter in there. You only have a very small portion left on the outside. With a female, it's, you've got a large portion left on the outside. So have you done um, labs yet? Yep. You've done that. Okay. Okay, cool, good, excellent. 
So I'm just trying to make it easier for you because <laughs> the urethra is between the clitoris and the vag vaginal opening. It's between that. So if you can identify, it's easy on a mannequin. Yeah. It's really hard on a human because the urethra itself is just a teeny little slit. And if you can get people, when you're trying to visualize it, if you can get the lady to cough for you yeah. or bear down, then sometimes it opens a little bit, but it's very hard to see. Okay, change now. Oops. Look at that. Went all silly again. Okay. <laughs> this is just a picture of what they call hypospadias or epispadias. And all it means is that the urinary... Um, <clears throat> opening, the meatus, is not in the right place on a male. Instead of being at the tip, it can be anywhere along the shaft, mm -hmm. as far as as far back as the perineal area. Very rare to see. Yeah. Um, I've only seen about two in my career that were just on the top here, hypothadias, which were just back a bit. So it isn't that common. It talks about urethral sphincter, and it is a circular band of skeletal muscle, and we both have women and men have it, and it acts as a valve. Voluntary. See, it says voluntary here. So obviously, I made a mistake, or I was typing too fast, and I did it wrong. I will go change that. Funny, I read through them like about 10 times, and I obviously didn't pick that up. Ooh, it's good. The sun's going down. Ooh, <laughs> I have to drive to Ashcroft. So I've got another hour on icy roads. Yeah, that's what you... Yeah, especially that area. The roads are really narrow and yippy and not good at all. Yeah. Okay, I'm done with that one. The micturition or urination reflex, it just is the voiding, right, when you pass water. So the stretch receptors, once the bladder fills, it <clears throat> stimulates the sensory fibers in the pelvic nerve. Stimulus travels to the pelvic nerve to sacrospinal cord and gives you that sensation that you need to go to the bathroom. Okay. So back to our neuro again. <laughs> oh, it's all crazy. Okay, the interneurons relate the sensation to the thalamus. The thalamus delivers it to the cerebral cortex. And voluntary relaxation of the external urethral sphincter and the relaxation of the internal cerebral, the urethral sphincter as well. So it's stimulated through our neurological system. The sun went down, it got really cold. It got cold in here, like immediately. That's yucky. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, they said it was 27 below on the top, up of, on top of the connector. It was really awful up there. Mm -hmm. I think it was about 8 when we, were, we arrived. It was 8 below. <clears throat> Okay. So that's quite easy to understand. The stretch is gonna is going to increase with the amount of urine in there, and it is about 500 mLs. Remember, I said 1,000 mLs was a lot, so about a 500 mLs that triggers the reflex, and that makes a lot more sense. Okay. 
So babies just lack the control um, just because they haven't uh, set up their neuro, neuro system very well yet. They have immature neurological systems. So they have to wait until those are established before they can learn to go to the bathroom properly. So potty training is not their fault. <laughs> they have to, you know, mature. <laughs> so incontinence, we talk about incontinence, especially in the elderly, the inability to control urinary urination voluntarily. Oftentimes with stress incontinence, if somebody coughs or um, sneezes, they release some of the urine out of their bladder because they've lost the um, strength in the internal and external urethral sphincter. So it loses its muscle tone. And that happens in the elderly. And it also happens a lot with women who just delivered babies and have had everything kind of stretched down there. So that happens for us too. That's right, postnatal. Age-related changes or decline in the function of the nephron. So it reduces the glomerular filtration rate. And they lose their ability to be sensitive to ADH. And they're not as conscious feeling the, the reflex to go to the bathroom. They can't feel it as well. So it's not their fault either that they're, <laughs> I know a lot of us when we're working with them in the long-term care units and gerontology, the frustration of constantly changing paths all the time, right? So, but it's not their fault. <laughs> They've just, I just don't want to be there. <laughs> I just, well, I want to die before I get there. <laughs> so, Reflex problems we discussed, the sphincter is not working as properly, and also any of these type of illnesses that have happened or diseases, a stroke, Alzheimer's disease, um, CNS problems affecting the cortex and the hypothalamus can also prevent people from being able to hold their urine. Not their fault. <laughs> okay. We talked about urinary tension caused from the enlarged prostate already. It restricts the flow. So extradiary system, the urinary system. So this is just a review of what we've already taken. So the urinary system is part of the excretory system. You can excrete on your skin, right? Perspiration will have some um, components in it. Respiration and digestive are all excretory. And that's it. Yay. We're done for today. Oh. We can all go drive on icy roads now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. So I will say goodbye to Alex and Fahima. We're all done for today. Um, yeah. We're good. Yay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. See you. Bye. See you next week. All right. Bye. See you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Wake up, Alex. It's time to go. <laughs> I should like to meet these people. You know, it seems really weird to talk to them and never meet them. It's odd. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. I prefer students in a classroom, tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. If you kind of want to reveal and understand, for me, it's really mm -hmm. personal. Yeah. I just kind of think if you're able to ask questions right away when you need to.